Welcome to the weekend recap of the stock and the bond market. I'm creating a series I hope to do every single week on every Sunday American time where we go through the day-to-day -day type of changes in the stock market. So look at how these stock charts are doing. Then we'll slowly work our way through more monthly type of trends. If you like the sound of that idea, want it to keep going, then make sure you hit the like button. Also comment down below saying that you like this series or not, make that nice and clear. Anyway, getting straight into the data here the biggest piece of news that happened in terms of the short term was in fact that inflation data that came out really just justifying that there might not be any rate cuts in 2024 now there's only one priced in for september's fed meeting that's it that's had a pretty disastrous effect on the bond markets and we've just crashed under all the major important moving averages so yes we are below the 20 50 100 and 200 day moving averages and when we see these sorts of moments on this price chart we can see what i call really waterfall type drops in the market. So we had this top of moment in September, October of 2022. And you can see back then we had a 20% drop in the TLT price when we crossed all those moving averages. There's some matching shorting data that goes along with that. So this is the volume of shorts that are chasing the TLT ETF. So this is basically the amount of people that are betting that the price of the bond market will go down. If you can hear that, that's my cat jiggling in the background. But you can see here that not as many people are pessimistic about the bond market compared to the start of 2024. So in other words, a lot of people are really pessimistic about the bond market that is driving interest rates higher. But this could tell me because we've had some recent highs not that long ago, three, four, six months ago, it could tell us we've got more room to move lower. There's more pessimism that could return. All I'm doing here is now showing you the interest rate equivalent of the bond market. People are selling treasury bonds that drives up the interest rate that people need to be paid in order to buy those treasury bonds and they really manipulate all loan rates throughout in this case the united states we've gone from 3.8 percent 10-year interest rates now to 4.55 percent and if that 10-year interest rate doesn't even go up higher than it is today it just stays where it is we're going to see the loan rates throughout the u.s economy start to actually move up higher because all those loan rates roughly track the trend of this 10-year treasury bond rate that has a flow-on effect to the u.s dollar strength so we have this message that the central bank of the united states might not be cutting this year that we've seen many stories of that developing that's only going to get stronger in the next few months whereas other regions like maybe europe australia is talking about rate cuts other places are more willing perhaps to cut interest rates at the central banks that means that the united states might be a attractive place to hold your investments because one you have a strong hot us economy so that means people want to flood their money into us dollars but also that means that the interest rate on us treasury bonds is more attractive to something like a australian treasury bond and that has a pretty disastrous effect on the stock market you wouldn't really think that looking at the stock market here now the s p 500 price chart we've had some really strong gains in the market all the way from october last year but we've just broken that 20 day moving average maybe this confirmation of the bond market crashing through all those moving averages we have the federal reserve saying they might not cut interest rates this year even take out the 50 100 day moving averages all of that just paints a picture that we could be seeing a correction 10 percent move down in the stock market maybe even a bear market a 20 percent downward move so i think that's possible I think if we push back interest rate cuts all the way to 2025, then that is definitely on the cards. Putting all of that together, we get a picture of the volatility of the S&P 500 or the stock market in general. We've really just started waking up the beast in the last week with that inflation data coming out. We've only just recently gone above a VIX of 15. So if anything, this could be the beginning of a larger correction, or we just see the volatility go back towards a 13, volatility drop back down, and we resume the market. It's kind of one of those two options. No one's really certain which one just yet. Next, we're gonna move on to sentiment because that really tells us about the next few months. 
if we are in extreme greed or fear, usually we have a swing to the other direction. Now the fear and greed index here, we move back towards neutral levels. However, I think this index can be a little bit too hot on the gun changing from one direction to another. And I think the AA II investor survey is much more accurate here, but it shows 47% of investors are confident we're gonna see stock market gains in the next six months. We have quite a bit, 30% neutral, and 22% of investors think we're headed lower in stock price. Now that's a bit of a catch 22, because if there's so few people pessimistic about the market, then that type of group is only going to grow more popular. You're gonna see more people selling off the stock market in six months time than you will today. They even had a special question in this week's survey. They asked people, what do you think about the valuation of S&P 500 companies. So 39 roughly percent of people have voted for some stocks are expensive, some are cheap. We then have 39% of people again saying stocks in general are overvalued. And then we have 17 and a half percent of people are saying the stock market is fairly valued. So overall we see here about 82% of people voted that at least some of the market is expensive. In other words, at best, this is a stock picker's market. Still some specials out there ready to be bought up, but the far majority of companies and people believe the stock market is overvalued. At the same time, we are extremely greedy. That's a pretty dangerous mixture. All right, guys, we're getting serious now. Jumpers off, party shirt on. We're going to look at sector rotation graphs. Now, I've made these bad boys myself where the x-axis is showing us the recent strength in that sector. The y-axis is a rate of change over the last two months. So I've also added some labels to help understand, but the healthcare sector I thought was quite special. It is both insanely weak and it's also getting weaker. In other words, this could be a falling knife type of sector. I've got a price chart of healthcare as well, just to get that picture across. We're down about five, 6% for the sector, which is actually quite a big move for healthcare, but this is a potential turnaround play and we've found it nice and early. So when this sector starts to strengthen, maybe for example, when it passes the 20 day moving average, for healthcare, XLV, the ETF that measures this, then that could be a rebound opportunity, maybe get some short-term gains, especially if you're leveraged out with some call options, that's how you can start to profit quite nicely. Besides healthcare, we've also got the consumer discretionary, consumer staple too, and also the technology sector, they're all in a weak getting weaker type of category. It's almost like the stock market is split in half. And then we've got more inflationary sensitive categories. We've got the material sector, so that is basically mining type companies. We've also got energy, which is obviously your crude oil companies, your um, Exxon Mobiles, that type of thing. But funnily enough, we've also got the financials and communication sectors that are also in a strong getting stronger category. And one last thing about those sectors that comes out to me is the communication sector that has just recovered from being in a recent weakness getting weaker. So in other words, communications could be a turnaround play that maybe is not too late to get into. Finally, we've got utilities, which is doing its own thing. So that is a company that is in the middle of its turnaround play. It is in the getting stronger recent weakness category. So overall, here is a picture of utilities for the last five years. We've had a recent move up higher, but overall the sector is quite oversold, quite low on valuations. So especially if we have a bit of a sell-off, maybe in the next couple months about inflation, this is more of a longer term type of swing trade potential if utility companies are in your area of expertise. Now, really, we've just got what is on the horizon. Do we have a recession coming up? And every week I'm gonna give you some similar data and I might throw in some unique parts every week as well. But first up we've got here is the National Financial Conditions Index, which basically measures three things, which is risk in the market. So how risky is it for people to basically lose money on their loans? We've got the amount of credit flowing. So in other words, are banks actually lending? And then we have the overall leverage. Do we have the ability to actually give out more loans or is the consumer, our businesses fully loaded up on loans? And at the moment we're sitting in a loose financial conditions 
part of the market. We're equivalent to really back in 2021, not quite as loose. We're equivalent more to about a 2018 or maybe back towards a 2013 type period. So we're not exactly in that full tap on gushing amount of liquidity flowing into the financial system. We're in a decent financial conditions place. So that gives us a little bit of strength behind all types of growth in the economy. And when we have a look at the total growth of loans and leases of all types of loans for all types of banks we have here, we're sitting at about a two and a bit percent, 2.2 percent type of gain in total loans. When you have a look at the history of the United States, that's nothing really fantastic. If anything, that's a barely growing type of economy. We're not in recession, but we're not fast growing either. So we looked at the commercial banking system. What about the central banking system? We've really got three forms of liquidity, the commercial banks, central banks, and then finally government spending is also a way to pump in liquidity. So here we've got the central bank's balance sheets and the blue line is my favorite. That gives us all the big dogs. We've got the Fed, the US, the ECB, the European Central Bank, we've got Bank of Japan in the name and People's Bank of China, so that's in the name too. So that's the blue line. And we see here that we've really deleted about two trillion US dollars worth of liquidity from the global financial system. In terms of the global economy, that's really only one, two percent of the global economy, not a huge amount of money that was deleted. And especially if we add back in the overnight reverse repo for America, I don't believe other central banks do this in the same vastness of dollar amounts as the US, but the US reverse repo, that's basically cash that was held at the central bank and it's been released back towards the commercial banking system. That decision is really run by commercial banks. They can take it out whenever they like, but that money's been drained out, about two trillion US dollars drained out over the last year. And that really combats all the type of money deletion we've been seeing from all central banks in the last year. If anything, we could actually be seeing a stimulative environment when we take into account this reverse repo, because when those banks take that money out, they go out and buy treasury bonds. They can also go out and conduct loans, except when you actually make loans to consumers, you're actually creating more productivity. You make that loan, that person goes off and buys a car. The car business that received that money then goes and spends it somewhere else. So usually you see a multiplier of effect of a times two times three. When you stimulate the economy, that creates further spending. So if anything, that's probably why we jump straight out of a recession in 2022. Government spending, but also shadow liquidity entering from the US Central Bank really pumped us through 2023. And the last story I've got here for you is about credit cards. So credit cards, yes, we had about $850 billion on credit cards right when the pandemic happened. We actually paid off a lot of credit cards during the pandemic. That took us down to about 750 billion. But from there, we've gone up to a trillion and 50 billion in credit card debt. Now that interest rate on the credit card debt is insanely high. It's way higher than any other time point in history. But for example, a high interest rate in 2019 was about a 15% per year. Now we're paying about 21 and a half percent interest rate on credit cards. And that's before you even take into account risk factors like credit scores or personal type of risk. But we're paying about 250 billion US dollars in interest today, whereas only a few years ago, we were paying about 100 billion US dollars. But overall, it does paint a picture that the longer term imagery of the market is not fantastic, not recessionary right at this moment, but it's not exactly the strong economy that a lot of people are talking about. All right, guys, let me know if you did like this recap top of view of the market. Make sure you comment down below if you like it so I keep on doing it. I wanna thank my YouTube members who sponsor the channel for one US dollar a month. That keeps the channel going for the long term. So if you've gotten anything out of this channel, that's a way to give back. Thanks for your time today, guys. See you next time, bye.